the commercial drone market is just getting started. I mean, if you think about how many drones are being used for commercial applications, it's really, really small. I mean, compared to what could be. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 324. What's happening in the drone industry today? For that question, we head to San Antonio, headquarters for Frost & Sullivan, and speak with Michael Blades, Vice President of Aerospace Defense and Security Americas region. Frost & Sullivan provides a comprehensive range of research services and state-of-the-art analytical tools to enable decision makers to use marketing information in more innovative and meaningful ways. Michael is an experienced military aviator with expertise in worldwide aerospace operations. He is an expert in researching and analyzing the military, civil, and commercial unmanned systems ecosystems, as well as markets related to defense training and simulation programs and technologies. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, Michael talks about some of the current trends in the drone industry. This is the second of two interviews with Michael on the drone industry. Today we cover drone delivery, urban air mobility, key trends to look for, and a couple of surprises. But before we hear from Michael, I want to thank those of you who are supporting my funding campaign. Whether it's a dollar, $100, or much more, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And by the way, if you have a great story on the use of drones that you'd like to share in a podcast, contact me at Randy at DroneRadioShow.com. So let's learn about the current trends in the drone industry with Michael Blades of Frost & Sullivan. Let's pick up the interview from part one, where I asked Michael to tell us what he sees in the area of drone delivery. <laughs> well, a drone delivery is very interesting to me because I think prior to COVID, we were just starting to see, you know, a little trend up. I, I think the success of Zipline and, you know, and the uh, the Part 135s from UPS and, and Wing, and I can't honestly remember if they were before or after COVID. I think they were just ginning up right before COVID happened. And then once COVID happened, you started seeing a lot more waivers to beyond visual line of sight for companies, you know, like we talked about aerobotic and drone up, actually drone up did a part 107 deliveries, which is interesting. Uh, and then, um, you know, Skyscopes and companies like that, that were doing a lot of delivery applications in order to, you know, meet that requirement for those really critically needed items. And, you know, I mean, Zipline even has an operation now here in the U.S. So I think that drone delivery isn't going anywhere. I think that the COVID response sort of moved the timeline to the left, you know, substantially. I think it forced, you know, regulatory agencies to move a little bit quicker in order to respond, just like the, the way that the medical community had to come up with a solution to COVID-19. The COVID response has, I think, really sort of accelerated drone delivery. Um, I still think there's going to be a, a very focused effort on providing critical items. I think it's going to be quite a while before we see a profit from delivering things that are, you know, retail types, you know, things, B2C uh, deliveries. Um, I think there'll be companies that engage in that and maybe it'll be at a loss for a while. But once people start getting those things, if you think about it, and I talked about this with someone just yesterday, well, the COVID response that we've seen, um, there's been a lot of, you know, curbside delivery and pickup service. And, you know, you can go to the grocery store and they'll bring your groceries out to you now. I don't think that that's going to go away after this. I think once people are, to a degree, once people are given a more convenient solution or more convenient option of of getting an item or, or getting a service, they're going to keep wanting that. So I think once you, you start seeing drone deliveries of things, I don't know if you saw Wing is going to be delivering or is delivering Girl Scout cookies, you know, 
I think I was also a COVID thing. I didn't want to go door to door because of COVID, but let's deliver cookies by drone. So that's going to take much longer than to have a positive revenue stream when compared to delivering critical items like, you know, what Zipline does with uh, blood and, and, and medical equipment and supplies and things like that. And especially the reason that it has been so successful is because it's being delivered in an area where there's really no other way to deliver it. So, you know, when you start solving problems that don't have you know, any, any other solution, then those things are going to accelerate and, and, and blossom. So, but I, I think that, that is a, a trend that we're going to see continue. What do you see in the area of urban air mobility? Urban air mobility, we've, we've done a lot of research and a lot of work on that. We had a report that we, we worked on from some clients and it came out with some really, we thought some really good information because we attacked it from the viewpoint of, you know, there's more than a hundred, a couple hundred. I think there's, they have a catalog like on evtil.org or evtil.news or whatever that website is, how many different companies have said that they're making some sort of prototype for urban air mobility or advanced air mobility. And it's, you know, it's in the hundreds. Well, obviously, you know, a very, very small percentage of those companies are going to survive. But what we thought was, if they build them, will will the people come to them? So we attacked it from a supply and demand question or a point of view to understand well, what the demand would be. And we found some, some pretty interesting uh, information. You know, we found out that, you know, a majority of people would be willing to fly air, air taxis if they were offered that option. Uh, we found out, you know, how much more they'd be willing to pay over, say, an Uber um, to have that ability to, you know, miss traffic and, you know, have a more convenience built in. And so it, it was a pretty cool study. And, uh, and we also did a, a timeline, you know, and so, um, some of these companies that are saying that they're going to have these capabilities in, in a certain year, you know, I mean, I think I've heard as early as 2023 for at least some certifications that might be a little aggressive, but uh, there's a lot of companies that are spending a lot of money in order to have a capability and, an, and a certified capability in the next several years. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people in the industries and I get a lot of naysayers and I get a lot of backers and somewhere in between we'll meet. But from my perspective, I think we're probably going to have larger delivery drones that are going to be delivering packages before we have a lot of the passenger aircraft. Um, because, couple of reasons. One is you don't have to worry about the uh, life support issues that you would on a, a passenger aircraft. And who knows what the standards are going to be? You know, are you going to have to have crash resistant seats? Are you going to have to, you know, have a specific kind of safety mechanisms, other safety mechanisms besides that, whether it's, you know, a certain kind of motor or a certain kind of, uh, are they going to have to have, you know, ballistic parachutes, those kinds of things. Well, what is it going to be that's going to, you know, allow them to be certified as safe enough to fly people around it? I think it took the 787, if I'm not mistaken, nine years to get certified from the time they just decided to start designing it until the time that it was certified airworthy. So that's quite a long time. And that's a large aircraft and it's a pretty intricate you know, piece of machinery. But it's also a very electrified aircraft, You know, kind of like what the uh, air taxis are going to be. So the other issue that makes automated aircraft flying, we want to compare it more to a larger drone, kind of like what Elroy Air is doing or maybe what Sabre Wing is doing on kind of a larger scale. Bell has the, the APT, autonomous pod transports, those kinds of things. The reason it would be easier in my perspective, it just is just me talking, but if you're carrying cargo in an aircraft and almost always it will be going from a defined location to a defined location. I can't think of it when it wouldn't. So you'd be going from an airport tarmac to say a distribution center or to a warehouse or a warehouse to a warehouse. So those routes can be standardized. So you know that the aircraft is going to be autonomous or not. It's going to be flying over the same area, the same spots every single time. And when you talk about an air taxi, you're not doing that because it's going to be going to, you know, it's going to be like an Uber. It's going to be going to a different point every time. So I think the urban air mobility market where you're using larger drones for cargo delivery will probably start before the autonomous urban air mobility aircraft for passengers and air taxis. So that said, I mean, you know, you, they're probably going to have the manned version of those things operating relatively soon, you know, so it's basically just going to be a helicopter that uses distributed electric propulsion instead of traditional helicopter rotors and, and motors. So that's going to happen first, but that's not really that much of a change, right? So the real ROI and the real ability to 
have cost efficiencies and whatnot. It's going to be when you take the, the pilot out of the mix, right? So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You mentioned a study that looked at the potential price that people would be willing to pay for an air taxi. We took a bunch of information from our mobility business unit, which keep track of variables. Basically, they keep what they call a smart city tracker. So they track all kinds of information on cities. So we took all these variables and what we did was we gave them weights and then we ranked them. And so we came up with a measurement of which cities around the world would be most likely to support urban air mobility or advanced air mobility first. Once we picked the cities we thought would be most ready, we put together a really interesting survey and sent it out to those cities. We surveyed over 4,500 people in 12 cities to get this information. And so it came back to tell us what percentage of people would be willing to, to ride on an air taxi, what they would be riding those air taxis for, what sort of trips would they be taking, would it be to the store, would it be to work, would it be to social gatherings, what would it be? Because each city is a little bit different, especially with what they pay now for transportation, the amount that they would be willing to pay over that was different. You know, you may have a city, say, in Africa. I think we had two cities in Africa where the income might be relatively low compared to other cities. And so they would be less likely to pay a premium for, you know, this air taxi ride. So in more affluent cities, you know, say like a a Paris or London, it was more. But I I think it was between like 20 and 50 percent above, say, what you would expect to pay for an Uber or a taxi that people would be willing to pay. I think we took an average of that, but it also varied by what you would be taking that ride for. You know, if it was someone taking a a ride to the airport, they'd be more willing to pay a premium. So it might be interesting in the future to see if there's a cost structure based on where people are going as opposed to just the distance. Anyway, it was pretty interesting to see that people would be willing to pay more and how much more they'd be willing to pay. What are the key trends that interest you today? One that that we talked about was the unmanned, unmanned teaming, and that's really interesting to me. And I think that's only going to expand. But what I see is interesting is the swarming stuff that we're seeing. From a collaborative standpoint, in order to conduct inspections, that's what really interests me. And I know there's a company out there, and they're focused on precision ag called Rantizo, and they had a, a FAA approval to operate drone swarms of up to three simultaneously so they can spray crops. And so that to me is interesting because, you know, before that, you know, you use one drone, and it would take, you know, oh, let's take off and spray and then land and redo it and then, you know, fill up the tank with whatever we're spraying with. And also I found there's a university, I think it's in, in the UK, University of Portsmouth, and um, they're teaming up with uh, Airborne Robotics, which I'm not very familiar with, and Bentley, you know, Bentley that does kind of the same stuff that Pixar does with building 3D models from data collected by drones. And actually, Bentley's stuff is really cool. But they're going to be working together to have an, an autonomous offshore wind farms inspection capability where they have the unmanned boats that carry the drones out, you know, to the, the offshore wind farm and, you know, do automated inspections. So there doesn't have to be someone that drives the boat out and then flies the drone. So the unmanned, unmanned teaming, and then when they do that, they do it with more than one drone at the same time. So you have unmanned, unmanned teaming and swarms together. So just all all this stuff coming together is really, really interesting to me. And I think um, we're going to see more of it as the, the technology advances. Did anything surprise you this past year? You know, we, we did see some accelerated M&A, mergers and acquisitions, in, in 2019 and 2020. And I expected it to accelerate more because of COVID. And I, I've, I've heard of some, you know, Ag Eagle bot measure and, you know, those kinds of things. But I, I really expected more things to happen, more companies to sort of cease to exist a, as a result of COVID because they weren't able to adapt and they weren't able to get work because, you know, people were not spending money. Now, there could be a bunch of companies out there that aren't operating that I just don't know about because, you know, they just went away and nobody knows. And they haven't, a lot of companies aren't going to make an announcement that they're no longer in, in <laughs> business. So that may be the case. But that's one thing that I, I think has sort of surprised me that there hasn't been more carnage from companies ceasing to exist because of COVID. And for my final question, Michael, what message would you like to leave regarding the drone industry? On the commercial drone side, we've talked so many years about, you know, DJI being in the lead and having 70% of the market and this and that. Well, 
the commercial drone market is just getting started. I mean, it's the, if you think about how many drones are being used for um, commercial applications, it's really, really small. I mean, compared to what could be. So I think that the message that I need to leave is that it, we're just at the start of this market. You know, there's a lot of things that are going to happen that are going to expand this market. Uh, the continuing uh, movement towards autonomy, the uh, continuing movement towards regulations that allow beyond visual line of sight flights, which are going to enable things like more deliveries, is going to enable things like swarming operations, it's going to enable multiple drones controlled by, you know, one person or one operation center or whatever. Um, it's going to enable a lot of these drone out of box companies to do what they do, where you just sit drones that have their own stations and they operate whenever they need to operate. And the only time you're going to know that there's an, even an issue is if there's some sort of problem. Otherwise, they're just going to go about their business and, and conduct whatever operations they need to conduct on, whether it's a scheduled basis or whether it's a queued by a sensor or whatever it is. So this market is just, you know, in its dawn. I mean, I think I've talked about before in reports where we've transition from a nascent to a growth market, but that growth is just starting. So I, I think that's the thing. I think uh, we're going to continue seeing um, a lot of innovation. Just when I thought there were, there were too many drone platforms out there, I see people coming along with drone platforms that are you know made to conduct very specific applications that other drones just can't do. And I think that's very cool. And I also think that that means that there's going to be a, a continued drive towards having drones that are based on open architecture. The companies that offer drone agnostic solutions are, are going to flourish because, you know, a lot of companies that use drones or that provide drone services are going to have mixed fleets in order to, you know, have all those different platforms that can meet all the different needs of, of their clients. So, like I said, it, it's still a market that is being defined and it will be for the next several years, but uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. There's going to be a lot of uh, changes and there's going to be a, a lot of um, innovation along the way. So That's it for episode 323 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Michael Blades of Frost & Sullivan. I want to thank Michael for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Frost & Sullivan or want to connect with Michael, check out the website at www.frost.com. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to droneradioshow.com donate. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me. And I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.